series entitled The Kingdom of Heaven. And so we're going to talk about the kingdom of heaven. And this is part number two. And uh, so open your Bibles, please, to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter number 13. Y'all glad to be here tonight? All right. We're going to have a good time. Good time in the house. Miss Eleanor, don't start yawning. If you start yawning, I'll yawn, and then everybody's going to yawn. Everybody's going <laughs> to I saw you back there. In fact, I feel a yawn coming on right now. Matthew chapter 13. And uh, all righty, looked out at verse number 24, please. Matthew chapter 13. Once you're there, say amen. And if you're still not there, say oh me. Oh me, oh me. All righty. And uh, Matthew chapter number 13, and uh, let's see here. We're going to start reading in verse number 20, uh, let's see here, 24. All right, here we go. Matthew 13, verse 24. By the way, if you don't have Bibles with you, we do have Bibles in the song racks, so feel, feel free to use those while you're here. And uh, Matthew chapter number 13, and again, verse number, 20, number 24. All righty, here we go. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, Didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servant said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, gather ye together first the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Now, jump down to verse 36. Verse 36. Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house, and his disciples came unto him, saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. He answered and said unto them, he that soweth the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. But the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world. And the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father, who hath ears to hear, let him hear. All right, so last week we started talking about the kingdom of heaven, and it was part number, part number one. And I explained to you that there are 32 verses in all of the Bible that have the phrase, the kingdom of heaven, in those verses. And they all appear in Matthew, chapter, in Matthew the gospel according to St. Matthew. Last week, we talked about the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. Tonight, we're going to talk about a man which sowed good seed. A man which sowed good seed. All right, let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for allowing us to be here this evening. I sure do love you, dear Lord, and I'm so grateful for all that you do for us. Thank you for being such a wonderful God. And Lord, tonight, I pray, Holy Spirit of God, please fill me with your power. I pray, dear Lord, for the mind of Christ. Help me to say only that which you once saved. Uh, once, once said. And then I pray for every person here, Lord, they'll all have ears to hear, a heart to receive, and a mind to comprehend. If there are any among us that need to be saved, Lord, help them to get saved tonight. Those who need to get baptized, help them to get baptized tonight. And then, Lord, bless all of us. Help us all to be willing 
and, 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 and earnest in making any decisions that you want us to make. And we'll give you all the glory for it now in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. A man which sowed good seed. Jesus, as he often did in the Bible, he used an earthly story to teach a heavenly truth. A lot of times when you read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you'll see Jesus teaching in parables, and that's, that's kind of like just an earthly story um, to teach a heavenly truth, and that's exactly what we just read. We just read a parable. And, um, and so this is primarily, this particular story is primarily speaking of those in the world who are involved in the kingdom of heaven. All right, so imagine in your mind, uh, Amer uh, uh, Jesus is addressing our country, all right, America. And he comes to our, our uh, country and he teaches just like he did in Israel. He came to Israel in this particular passage and he taught them this, this uh, parable. So Jesus would be coming here in 2021 and he would simply say this, the kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. And then he went on to explain there's an enemy that came and sowed tares. And then there's going to be a harvest at the end. The, the, the tares are going to be caught up in, in, in one bundle and then cast into a furnace of fire. And then the, the wheat or the good seed is going to be gathered into the kingdom. And so what this parable primarily is talking about, if, if you understand now, is talking about all the churches all over the world. But we're going to talk about America right now, just our, our country, right? So all the churches where the kingdom of God is present, in every church, God says there are wheat and then there are tares. And he explains it in this particular passage. I'm going to give you four points tonight. If you like to write down notes, uh, these are going to be points that you could write down. And uh, look at verse number 37. Look at verse 37. All right. In verse 37, it says, He answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world. All right. So, point number one, write this down. Jesus is active in the world today. Jesus is active in the world today. I think a lot of us, because we have not seen Jesus with our eyes, that we just think he's irrelevant. He's not really here. I, I've had some people tell me in recent weeks and such that they just think Jesus in the Bible is just a book full of stories, you know, like fables, you know, like, oh yeah, Little Red Riding Hood, you know, uh, the, the three pigs and the, and the big, bad red, you know, big bad wolf and, you know, all of that stuff. No, 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 this, this is not a, a, a child's rhyme. This is not a fable. This is actually history. That's what this book is. It's a history book. It is a story. It's his story. That's history. Now, what happens is uh, Jesus really is active in our day and age right now. He is behind the scenes because we can't see him with our physical eyes doesn't mean he's not there. Man, look, I promise you heaven is real. I promise you hell is real. And just because we don't see it right now with our eyes, it doesn't make it less real. I mean, there is going to come a day when all of us die, and we're going to stand before our maker, our creator. We're going to stand before Jesus, and some of us will get to go to heaven, and others will not. And the truth of the matter is, all of this is real. Uh, I wish we had that understanding as a whole, but Jesus is active in the world today. He is planting his word in the hearts of men. If you look at verse number 38, it says, the field is the wor world, the good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. All right, let me give you some uh, cross-references. Keep, keep your bookmarker there in Matthew 13, but let's turn over now to John chapter 6. Go to John chapter number 6. You're sitting here tonight, and you might think, okay, Jesus is active in the world today. What is he doing? If he's active, what's going on? Let me explain to you. John chapter 6, and look down at verse number 63. John chapter 6, and verse number 63. It says this, it is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. All right, so what is it that Jesus is doing in our world today? He's trying to speak his word to us. His word is spirit 
and his word is life. I, I've said this many times before. This is the most important possession any person can ever possess. The word of God is amazing. It's, it's, it's life-changing. It is spirit, and it is life. And so today, in, in our country, and in our city, in our communities right now, Jesus is trying to get his word to everybody. He's trying to speak his word. Um, I, asked, I went soul winning today, and I asked a guy, he just moved here from New York not too long ago, moved, moved his family uh, to Longmont. I saw him at a park over at uh, Roosevelt Park. And as I was talking to him, I said, man, have you gone to church much? He goes, well, you know, I was baptized as a baby he said I've been to church here and there but not really a whole lot and I, and I gave him my testimony and I said June 15 1980 I said a preacher asked me if I knew for sure when I died I'd go to heaven and I responded and said man I sure hope I'm going I did not know for sure but I said I hope I'm going I want to go and I said the preacher took the Bible and he read to me the verses in the Bible where it says how a person can know for sure that they'll go to heaven. It blessed my heart. It really encouraged me. And I said to him, has anybody ever showed you those verses? And he goes, no. He goes, I've never seen those verses. And I said, well, can I show you real quick? And he said, sure. And I stood there at the park, and I, I read the verses to him. And about 15, 20 minutes later, he was bowing his head, praying, and asking Jesus to save him. Now, why did he do that? It's because the word of God is powerful. That's why. Can you imagine? Listen, if this thing was not real, let's, supp let's suppose this was a fairy tale. You know, there is no Jesus. There's no heaven. There's no hell. There's no God. There's none of it, right? Can you imagine someone like me or someone like you going up to a complete stranger in a park and just opening up a book and reading some verses to him and 20 minutes later, they're bowing their heads praying with you, and these are people that you've never met before today. I mean, it just wouldn't happen. I mean, it's not logical. I mean, it's just not. I was talking to Christian at, uh, at work last week, and uh, I'm a chaplain where he works, and uh, I got to talk to him about 30 minutes, and, and he got saved. And he said, I want to come visit your church. I said, come on, man. He goes, I want to bring my wife. I said, more the merrier. <laughs> and so, uh, so he came to church last Saturday night. And uh, during the invitation, I just walked up to him and I said, look, man. I said, you got saved. And Kim said she was saved. I think you said when you were 11. Back in Minnesota, I feel so sorry for you. The Denver Broncos just beat up on the Minnesota Vikings today. It was like, it was embarrassing. It was like 33 to 6. I mean, I'm just, I'm trying to comfort you tonight. That's what I'm trying to do. But, <laughs> but, but the thing is, I just said, look, I said, Christian, now that you're saved, you know, here's what baptism means. And before I even asked him, do you want to get baptized? He said, let's do it. He said, honey, let's do it together. And they did. They both got baptized last Saturday. Now watch this. Watch this, man. If all of that, if all of this was fake, I mean, come on. What adult is going to say, yeah, I want to get baptized for something that's not real? <laughs> you know, I mean, it, it just doesn't happen. When Jesus is working in the world today, he wants to get the word of God into our hearts. And when the word of God gets into our hearts, the Bible says that is spirit, that is life. You know, when I, when I go out soul winning and talking to people about the Lord, there's a lot of people in the world that are hurting. hurting. I mean, there are a lot of people that are hurting. I, I'm so angry inside about COVID-19 last year. I mean, I'm just, I, I cannot tell you how upset I am. I don't think about it too much because I don't want to be upset all the time. But our government has lied and lied and lied and lied and lied. And they have put restrictions on us that were not necessary. They keep talking about follow the science and all this stuff. And the, and the majority of the things that they talk about is so unscientific. There's no science behind any of it, the majority of it. And there's so many people that have been addicted to alcohol and drugs in the last year and a half. There's so much domestic violence, child abuse, because people have been forced to stay home. And then they, you know, they didn't know how to live around each other. You know, I mean, really, right? Suicides are up, up, up more than they have ever been. I mean, ever been. I heard this week, this week, another young person committed suicide. I mean, this week, I heard about it. Someone sent me a text message, please pray for this family. 
so-and-so committed suicide, their best friend. I mean, this is an unbelievably difficult time. Businesses, small businesses have closed and have still not reopened. Some of them have closed for good. The economy, a lot of people, you know, yeah, the government's given free money out, right? You know, you, you get 500 bucks a week or 600 bucks a week if you just extra. Don't go to work. I, went, I told you this last week. I went to Jack in a Box in, um, in Brighton uh, last week. And I went to go in the inside in the lobby. I wanted to sit down and eat and it was locked. And I pulled through the drive through and I said, hey, what's going on? And she goes, I said, is this COVID related? She said, well, kind of. She said, uh, we can't hire anybody. I'm the only cashier. I said, what do you mean you can't hire anybody? She, says, no. she goes, nobody wants to come to work. They get paid more money from the government to stay home than they do to come work at Jack in the Box. I mean, this is terrible what's going on. You know, <laughs> the government is the only institution in the world that can print its own money. <laughs> but there's going to be a payday coming. There's going to be a payday coming. But I could go on and on about how COVID-19 has wrecked havoc. And I'm not talking health issues. Yeah, some people have died, of course. I mean, COVID-19 is a real thing, just like the flu is. You know, just like pneumonia is, just like a lot of the, uh, things that cause people to die every year. Uh, someone just said, they, they, uh, the CDC just discovered or made known publicly that, uh, that last year, the whole time they were doing COVID tests, that they, they revealed to us that the COVID tests could not distinguish between COVID and just a regular flu. So everything was COVID. The flu kind of went away. Isn't it amazing? Nobody caught the flu last year. Everybody got COVID, though. Uh, but, but it's just, you know, all these things, right? So as I go out and talk to people in the world, people are hurting. And I mean they're hurting really bad. CNN ain't going to help them. The news networks ain't going to help them. This is what's going to help them. Because it's real. It's life. It's spirit. In John chapter 6, verse 63, Jesus said, The words I speak unto you, they are life and they are spirit. So, Jesus is active in the world today. What's he trying to do? He's trying to give us life. He's trying to give us spirit. You know, make our lives exciting. You know, how many of you want to live a life and say, Man, I hope today's the most boring day I've ever lived in my life? <laughs> no, but Jordan, what in the world, man? I tell you, way to ruin my illustration. And uh, Maylin, would you slap her for me? All right. But the thing is, no, you don't want to wake up and say, man, I hope I lose my job today. Jordan. <laughs> and uh, uh, and I, I, I hope something really bad happens. No. When you wake up in the morning, most of us would like to have that sense of optimism and hope that we can actually have a good day. And Jesus wants us to have a good day. And the way we're going to have it is if we embrace his word. Why? Because his word is real. It's true. It's spirit. It's life. It's a benefit. And that's how much Jesus wants to impact us. Listen carefully. Jesus desires to grow his kingdom. Jump back to Matthew chapter 13. And I want you to look down at verse number 38. Matthew chapter 13. And let's look at verse 38 again. We, we have already discovered that the one who is sowing the good seed is the Son of Man. That's just a phrase that's given to Jesus. So Jesus is the one that's sowing the good seed. We also realize the field is the world. So Jesus wants to go into all the world and spread his word to try to give people hope, life, spirit, encouragement, joy, all of it. And then in verse 38, it says this, the field is the world, the good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. All right, number two, write this down. People in the kingdom of God fall into two categories. People in the kingdom of God, that's our churches all over America, every single church in America, everybody falls into one of two categories. First category is good seed, the second category are tares. And that's what it says there in verse number 38. It says, the field is the world, the good seed are the children of the kingdom. That's the children of heaven. And then it says, but the tares are the children of 
the wicked one. And we've learned the wicked one is the devil. So the good seed, here's what they are, they're legitimate Christians. What's the biggest complaint? What's the biggest complaint people who don't go to church have about church? The biggest complaint. What was it? Bunch of hypocrites that go there. I mean, that's the number one as far as I can tell. Why don't you go to church? Well, church is nothing but a bunch of hypocrites. I usually say, why don't you come? One more won't hurt. <laughs> but it, <laughs> I really don't, Christian. I don't. I just say it in my mind. Have you ever said something in your mind, but it never came out of your mouth? That's kind of what that is. <laughs> but anyway, uh, but the fact of the matter is, yeah, yeah, there are hypocrites in church, and they're called tares. The word tares means a weed. Now, what's a weed in the kingdom of God? It's not a real believer. Have you ever heard in, in our churches across the country of a priest or a pastor or a man of the cloth who abused an, a, a minor? Have you ever heard about that? Not a legitimate believer. Not at all. Um, I've heard of all kinds of things in all different denominations. It's not limited to one denomination. It's not like one group of churches is just bad. No, I mean, there are tears everywhere. How, how about this? Have you ever heard about someone in a church not treating people properly? Like, not in love, but they're like mean and unkind and push people away? Have you ever heard of a person doing that? Man, it's everywhere. They're, they're, right, Brother Jerry? They're... They're, okay, all right, just want to make sure you're listening. And, uh, but, uh, but they're everywhere. They're tares. They're not legitimate believers. There are people that come to churches, the Bible calls them wolves in sheep's clothing. They're not out to help the sheep. They're there to devour the sheep. They're there to hurt, to cause pain, to cause problems. You know what I've often said? When you think of a safe space, Right? Remember when Trump was running for president? There was all these safe spaces all over the country, you know. Trump won. All right, we got to have a safe space for people to go and cry and color with crowns, all that stuff. All right, but legitimate safe spaces, right? I could not think of a safer place in the world, supposed to be, than church. I mean, this is a place where everybody should come and feel loved, feel welcomed, get their needs met to have their burdens lifted, to be able to find answers to their problems. Of all places in the world, the church ought to be that place. But why often is it not? It's because of the tares, the people that are not legitimate believers, all right? So Jesus said in his kingdom, there are good seed and there are tares. The good seed are legitimate Christians and the tares are what they're called weeds. I mean, like, literally, weeds. They're not believers. These are the people that are involved in the kingdom of heaven or in churches all over our world. Okay, number three. Look at verse 39. Now watch this. Verse 39. It says this. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. All right? So number three, write this down. Our common enemy is the devil. Our common enemy is is the devil. Listen to this carefully. Why are there problems in the world? Why is there evil in the world? How about this one? Why is there sin in the world? It's all because of the devil. It's not God's fault. When bad things happen, a lot of times people get bitter at God. God, if you are really a loving God, why did you do this to me? Or why did you let this happen to me? God gets accused or blamed for all kinds of things. And the truth of the matter is, the enemy is the devil. He's the one that's sowing the tares. He's the one that wants to kill and to destroy and to steal. He's the one that wants everything to fall apart in your life. He's the one that wants everything to fall apart in the church. Our common enemy is the devil. He's trying to hinder the kingdom of heaven from growing. Look over at 2 Timothy chapter 2. Keep your bookmark there or a piece of paper in Matthew 13 because we'll be coming back. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 2. I want you to see this now. 2 Timothy chapter number 2, and I'm going to read verses 24 through 26. Y'all still glad to be here tonight? 
By the way, you need a preacher that has enough courage to tell you the truth when you come to church. Now, I'm telling you the truth in love. I'm not up here, like, ripping your faces off or well, somewhat Christian. I mean, maybe just a little bit, right? I mean, <laughs> but, uh, well, Jordan, for sure. I mean, you should, you know, I don't even know if she's going to have a job on Tuesday when she shows up to work. I don't even know. Uh, but, uh, but as far as, you know, you need the truth, don't you? You need someone that says, hey, tell me what reality is. Tell me what the truth is, all right? Look at 2 Timothy chapter 2 and look at verse 24. Ready? It says, and the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient. All right, so that verse is saying, I'm the servant of the Lord because I'm the preacher, and this book was written to Timothy, which was a pastor of a church. And Paul said, Timothy, you don't go, you don't go to church to fight people. That's what the word strive means. So I'm not up here tonight trying to pick a fight. I'm not up here trying to fight with anybody. It says, but I got to be gentle unto all men, ready, apt to teach. Now, what am I supposed to teach? The word of God, the truth, right? And then it says, patient. That means I got to allow you time to, to let it sink in, to let you grasp it, to let you say, oh, yeah, I should probably start changing the way I live a little bit, right? Now, let's continue. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, that means these people are their own worst enemy. They, they're opposing themselves. If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the what? The truth. Now watch this. And that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. Now wait a second. Who's the enemy? The devil. What is he trying to do to us? He's trying to snare us. And, there's a, and how does he snare us? Listen to this carefully. He snares us with lies. He snares us with lies. So in other words, here's God, Jesus, trying to spread his word. And what, his, what is his word? It's the truth. He's trying to spread his word, the truth. What is the devil trying to do? He's trying to snare you with a lie. Oh, I'm sure if the devil was in this room right now, he might say, don't listen to Pastor Sulian. Look at him. Who does he think he is? He's up there preaching this like he knows what he's talking about, like he's the only one that's right, like everybody else in the world is wrong. Why are you listening to him? Don't listen to that book. That book is subjectional. In other words, it's up to everyone's own interpretation. You can interpret it one way, and someone else can interpret it a different way. Everybody's right. Nobody's wrong. And the devil's throwing out all these lies. And when he does, he's trying to snare us. He's tr okay, he's trying to tell you alcohol really won't hurt you. Go ahead and drink. It's okay. It hurts everybody else, but not you. Everybody else goes to jail. Everybody else, it wrecks their marriage. Everybody else, it causes problems. But you can handle it. Go ahead. It's all right. How about that marijuana stuff, right? Like, you know, Colorado legalized it. Hey, it's legal. That doesn't mean it's right. Just because just it's legal. But the devil comes to you and he lies to you. And he tries to say, hey, it's okay. Everybody's doing it. You can do it. You'll have fun. No harm will come. And so he snares you in a lie. What's my job as the servant of the Lord? I'm supposed to preach the truth. I'm supposed to be apt to teach. I'm supposed to be gentle to everybody. In meekness, that means humility. In other words, I'm no better than anybody else. I'm just one sinner trying to help a bunch of sinners not to sin. <laughs> That's all I am. That's all I, I'm not better than anybody, but God has commissioned me to, to preach. So I'm preaching the truth. Why? So that people may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil. You know, the longer I live, the more I hate the devil. I mean, I hate the devil. Oh, my soul, he has wrecked so many lives. He has caused so many problems and pain and heartache. It all started with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. You know why, ate, why Eve ate of that forbidden fruit? It's because the devil messed with her. The devil messed with her. And from that one decision to disobey God, eat of the forbidden fruit, the whole human race was plunged into sin. I hate the devil. The longer I live, 27 years I've been pastoring this church, I see the devil wreck lives. You know, we, we've had young people die prematurely. We've had marriages 
and to divorce. We've had people that, that succumb to addictions. I mean, it, the list goes on and on and on. And it's all because of the devil and his lies. Please believe me, the devil's not your friend. Jesus is. He's real. He loves you. And this book right here, the Word of God, it'll help you so much more than anything the devil tries to help you with. This is a good book. It's a good way to live. I said, number one, Jesus is active in the world today. Number two, people in the kingdom fall into one of two categories. They're either good seed or they're tares. Number three, our common enemy is the devil. Number four and last, I'm going to give you this point, and then we're going to look at two subpoints. all right? First of all, go back to verse 39 of Matthew chapter 13. We're going to give you the final point, and then again, we have two subpoints. That's A and B, and then I'll wrap the sermon up. Matthew chapter 13, y'all still with me tonight? Amen. All right, look at verse, look at verse, well, thank you, all right. You said amen, and you lifted up a basketball. What does that mean? <laughs> amen, woo, here's a basketball, all right. <laughs> what is going on around here? All right, Matthew chapter 13, look down at verse number 39. <laughs> Sorry, Miss Amy, I mean, we just, uh, we're just family here, you know. We bring basketballs to church. I mean, who knows what we'll bring next time. <laughs> All right, look at verse 39. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and them which do iniquity and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. The fourth and final thing, write this down if you're taking notes, the time of harvest will reveal all. The time of harvest will reveal all. Now listen to this carefully. Listen to this carefully. I know this is hard to understand, but it's true. Listen to this carefully. Nobody is going to get away with anything. Sometimes we, we see things happen in the world that are not right, that are unjust, and it looks like the people are going to get away with it. Sometimes we can get frustrated and say, how come good things happen to bad people and bad people, uh, you know, or uh, I'm sorry, uh, bad things happen to good people and then bad people seem to have good things happen to them. What's going on? It doesn't seem right. Well, here's the thing. When the harvest comes, every, every wrong will get made right. Every injustice will be balanced. Everything. So let me explain this to you. In verse number 41, look down if you would please, at verse number, number 41, it says this, The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend. All right, so letter A. What's going to, I said the time of harvest will reveal all. What's it going to reveal? First of all, letter A, those gathered out. Those who are gathered out out of the kingdom who are they it says those that offend and them which do iniquity now wait a second who are the who's the one that's getting offended you ready for this it's god it's god that's getting offended can i tell you something right now the last person in this world that you should ever want to offend is God. I mean the last person. Those that offend him, they're going to be gathered out. I mean, they're gone. And I'm going to tell you something right now. The Bible says offenses are going to come. It's going to come. I mean, I, look, I'm just standing up here right now preaching the truth. I'm sure somebody, either listening online or here tonight, has, get, has gotten offended at something I've said. I mean, it's just a possibility, right? I mean, it's, it's just the world in which we live. But the last person you want to offend is God. 
because he's the one that can do anything. God says this, don't fear those that can kill your body. He says, if you're going to fear anybody, fear the one that can kill your body and cast your soul into hell. Sometimes people say, I don't think it's right that God casts anybody into hell. Okay, when you die and stand before God, you tell him. So I just don't think that's right, God. I mean, go for it. I mean, I, look, I, I can tell you, I hate the thought of hell. I hate the thought of anybody going to hell. I, I really do. It rubs me the wrong way. But I'm not going to go to God and say, you're a bad God because hell's real. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to get everybody from going to hell that I possibly can. Because it is real. And I don't want anybody to go there. But there's going to come a time, the harvest, the end of the world, when God's going to reveal everything. And I mean everything. And here's what's going to happen. There be those that are gathered out. These are those who offend. That means they cause dis pleasure to God they cause displeasure to God then there's a second explanation of those who are going to be gathered out and that's those who do iniquity what God calls wickedness now I can take a whole hour and I can talk to you about what God calls iniquity and what God calls wickedness we don't have the time so I'm not going to spend an hour doing that, okay? I'll spend two hours. <laughs> Lift up the basketball. Come on. And, uh, <laughs> but, but, so let's just suffice it to say tonight that there are things that God calls wickedness. And it's crystal clear in the Bible. Now, our politically correct world gets offended at the word wickedness or iniquity. How dare anybody judge anybody else for what they do? That's what the world says. Well, listen, if I'm just reading the Bible, to be honest with you, I'm not the one that's judging. God is the one that has already judged, right? I'm just reading it. I'm just explaining it. I'm just talking about it. But there is wickedness in this world. Now, I'm going to tell you this right now. All these people that think it's great to participate in wickedness and iniquity when they stand before God, they're going to be sorry that they participated in it. Because God says, that, that's not going to be in my kingdom. It's not going to be in my kingdom. So the first group that's mentioned are those who are gathered out. The second group, if you look at verse 43, it simply says this. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of of their father who hath ears to hear let him hear all right so the last point letter b is this those who are rewarded we see those who are gathered out that's those who offend and those who do iniquity and then we see those who are rewarded who are those that are going to shine as the sun it says the righteous the righteous now the word righteous is not a bad word amen that's a word you should, you should ascribe to. You should say, you know what? I would like to be righteous. I would. We, we, we sometimes think of the word righteous and we think of it as like self-righteous and piety and proud and arrogant. That's not what it's talking about at all. The word righteous is just one who does right things. In other words, you treat people well. Wouldn't this world be a lot better world if we loved each other a little bit more? <laughs> Wouldn't this world be a better world if we were honest with each other more? How about this? Those who are big, that's adults. Those who are tiny, that's children. Wouldn't this be a better world if those who are big would treat those who are tiny a lot better? There's so much abuse in this world. It bothers me. You know how much it bothers God? You ready for this? God said... It would be better for you that you take a millstone and wrap it around your neck and you be cast into the depths of the sea. That would be better than to offend a little one. You know, all these adults that are abusing young people, children, minors, they're going to have their day when they stand before God. They really are. You ought to, I think if, if more people were righteous, it'd just be a better world. 
And when the kingdom of heaven, when the harvest comes and, and, and Jesus comes back again, those who are righteous are going to get rewarded. Now, obviously your righteousness cannot save you. The only one who can save you is Jesus Christ. And when you call upon his name to be saved, he'll save you. He'll write your name in the book of life. And once your name's written in the book of life, you're going to heaven. You made the reservation and praise God for that. I do not go to heaven on my righteousness. I go to heaven on his righteousness. Amen. Isn't that a good thought? There's only one person that deserves to go to heaven, and that's a perfect person. Have you all ever met a perfect person? Not in person. There's only been one. That's Jesus. So he deserves heaven. Every one of us, we need help. And that's what Jesus is for. When he came to earth to die on the cross, he did that to pay for our sins so that we could be saved and we can have a home in heaven. And that's wonderful. But guess what? When you call upon Jesus and you ask him to save you, your life did not end. Amen? Miss Amy, you got saved last Saturday, right? Seven days ago, Miss Catherine prayed with you at your home. Aren't you glad your life didn't end? <laughs> and then your son, he got saved last night. You know what? Um, tell me your first name again, buddy. Kenneth. That's right, Kenneth. I prayed with Kenneth and... Uh, after I prayed with him, he got this big old smile on his face. And I think he told you what he told me. He said, all this time I've been praying to be saved, but I didn't know how to do it right. And he goes, tonight I learned how to do it right. And he just had a big old smile. Wasn't that a good day, man? That was a good day, Kenneth. But guess what? When he got saved, his life didn't end. It's not over. Now watch this. Now we have the Christian life to live. And you've got a choice to make. Are you going to live what God calls in his word a righteous life? Or are you just going to do whatever you want? If you decide to live a righteous life, when the harvest time comes, God's going to reward you. And by the way, that reward is going to be forever. I mean forever. If you choose not to live a righteous life, you're still saved. You know, you called upon Jesus. You've asked him to save you, so you'll get to go to heaven, but you won't have anything to show for it. You won't have any rewards. You know, there, you ever heard the expression, I'm almost done. You ever heard the expression where God says, lay up treasures in heaven? Did you ever hear that expression? Well, guess what? The way you live your life can be laying up treasures in heaven. But if you don't live righteous, when you get to heaven, you'll be there. But you won't have any treasures that you laid up ahead of time. So listen, the end of the world, when Jesus comes back. Okay, so what should we do? Here's the summary of the whole thing. Say, preacher, why are you preaching this? I don't know. I haven't, I haven't figured it out yet. No, I'm serious. <laughs> Here we go. You ready? Four things. Write this down. This is the conclusion. Here we go. Number one, obey the word of God. Just write that down. What should I do because of what you said? You said Jesus is active in the world today. People in the kingdom fall into one of two categories, either good seed or tares. Our common enemy is the devil. And the time of harvest is going to reveal all. Those who are gathered out, those that displease God and do wickedness, and then those who are rewarded, those who are the righteous. So what should I do? Number one, obey the word of God. Number two, separate yourself from the world. Separate yourself. Don't be a part of the evil of this world. Just because the evil's in the world doesn't mean you have to be a part of it. Do you remember when you were in school? This is years ago, right? Right, Christian? Can you remember that far back? Sometimes I... <laughs> Don't stick your tongue at me. And uh, You're acting like you've been here for years. I mean, come on. Church members stick their tongue at me. Uh, but uh, remember when you were back in school, didn't you, you remember when your parents told you there are certain people they didn't want you to hang around because they were a bad influence, right? Well, that's kind of how it is now. We're adults, but there's a whole bunch of bad in this world. So learn to separate yourself from it. Don't participate in it. Number three, write this down. Be like God. Be like God. There's a verse in the Bible. We don't have time to look at it. It's in 1 Peter chapter 1. God says, be ye holy for I am holy. So why should you and I try to be holy? Because that's who God is. He's holy. And we should try to be like him. Number four and last, win souls 
for Christ. Win souls for Christ. Christian, did you feel happy a week ago when I got to pray with you? And you know what you, you know, I, I got to pray with Christian. You know what he did as soon as he got done? His supervisor came up. Now, he might have thought initially, I'm in trouble. <laughs> but no, he's not, because I was paid to go there and talk to him. But was she your supervisor? Okay. And I prayed with her, and you didn't know it, but I prayed with her like two years ago. But anyway, his supervisor came up, and he goes, guess what? He goes, I got my name in the book of life. You remember telling her that? You know why? Because that's awesome. That's awesome. There are people all around you in your world that would love to know for sure they're going to heaven. They would love to know how to get their name in the book of life. They just need someone like you and me to tell them. And guess what? The more people you tell, the more heaven's going to be populated. And when you get to heaven, your Savior is going to go, at a boy, at a girl, way to go. You did well. You did good. I just want my Savior to say that. I don't want to get to heaven and have my Savior go, I wish you wouldn't have done that. That really wasn't a smart thing to do. You know, how many of you like me have graduated from the school of hard knocks? You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but when I get to heaven, I don't want to be the king of the hard knocks. <laughs> I don't want to be the one that has done so many things to disappoint God that he just has to go, <sighs> when he sees me. I'd rather have him say, way to go, man. I'm so proud of you. You did well. You did well. So let's do that. Let's obey the word of God. Let's separate ourselves from the evil in this world. Let's learn to be like God, be holy because God is holy. And then let's win as many souls to Christ as we possibly can. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for allowing us to be here this evening. What a joy it is to be in the house of the Lord. And I thank you, Father, for your goodness and grace and kindness. And boy, what a wonderful time we've had studying your word and reading it and preaching and laughing and talking and, and just learning. And so, Lord, I pray you help us, help us, help us to realize it's all real. Jesus is real. Heaven is real. Hell is real. Help us to live our lives in such a way that we're on the right side of things. And the only way we can be on the right side of things is if we do everything according to the Bible. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed.